All right. Good morning. How are you doing today? Is everything all right? Um, <clears throat> we are going to switch our attention, focus a little bit from what is going at state level. I mean, among the states in the international relations within the Middle Eastern region now to a to a field where we deal mostly with so-called non-state actors. So, of course, states are the primary units of analysis in our study, in our department, in our discipline. But non-state actors have become much more important in some respects, of course, or at least capture the attention of um, uh, the secret analysts, of course, government officials, security forces, and when, when, when I say non-state actor, of course, there are different definitions of non-state actors. But um, in our literature, we mostly refer to the terrorist organizations or organizations that use force violence as a means of achieving their goal. So um, that means we are going to talk about terrorism today and next Tuesday and most likely next Friday. And then the following week on Tuesday, we will have this simulation. And then the 31st of December will be the last day of the year, will be the last day of classes. So um, I believe there will be classes. I mean, I'll be around. So I would like to see you around. But if for some reason you just disappear and to visit your parents or start celebrating the new year, from the beginning, from the beginning of today, so uh, it's up to you. But I would strongly recommend you to be present, not only as you are now today, but also on Tuesday next week. And of course, definitely on, t on the simulation um, class for the following Tuesday and next Friday. Uh, you might somehow be excused if you are not here on 31st of December, but I strongly recommend you to be here anyway. All right. Uh, the Terrorism is, of course, our subject today. And I um, attached to uh, one of my emails two pieces of reading, uh, one from uh, one by uh, Zeynep Sutelan. She is actually a civilian expert at the Center of Excellence Defense Against Terrorism, and she is doing her PhD in the International Relations Department at Middle East Technical University. And she is also a part of being a you know, a PhD student who pursues a degree in international relations, but also writes the speeches of high-ranking generals in Turkish general stuff. So she is good in writing. She is good in compiling different ideas, opinions, and her piece actually uh, is is a chapter which will soon be published by iOS Press in the Netherlands, and this is an overview. Something that is useful for uh, students at your level who don't have prior exposure to anything substantial with respect to terrorism. What are the definitions of terrorism? How did it originate? Uh, what are the roots? And what are the issues that we are going to tackle, we are going to deal with? Um, so this is something, if you haven't done so, you should have read already by today because uh, this is an attachment that I sent you on, tu uh, on Tuesday, yes, this week. If you haven't done so, it is very essential that you read it because um, you will be responsible for subjects that I cover in this um, chapter for the final exam. The other is, again, from another Turkish uh, writer, which, whom someone you know, I, I believe, Özgür Özdemar, used to be a professor in a different university, but he joined us uh, I believe last year, and uh, he sent this piece when I was and still am the editor of the journal which published this, Defense Against Terrorism Review. And it was one of the very interesting compilation of theoretical approaches to terrorism because as you must have understood so far if you had a chance to read, at least skim through these two pieces of writing, uh, you must have acknowledged, understood the biggest problem is what? What do you think is 
the most important problem, among other, you know, the security implications of uh, terrorism. Of course, it takes lives. It, it claims the lives of mostly innocent people and themselves, because we're talking about what is called suicide bombing, suicide terrorism. But we are looking at the issue, of course, from all all sides, all perspectives. We're trying to do so in order to better understand the subject at hand. What are we dealing with? But there is one fundamental problem in dealing with this problem. I mean, something that is essential. Eugene? Can you speak up a little bit? The definition of the terrorism, the common and general Yeah. The, the biggest problem is indeed the definition of terrorism, which acts constitute what we call a terrorist act. I mean, how do we define whether an act is a terrorist act or it is something else? When I say something else, I don't mean to undermine any other forms of violence or any other definition of you know, use of force, use of violence by non-state groups. But what I mean here is, unless there is a common understanding of what terrorism is or what constitutes terrorism, it will be very difficult to take concerted actions. Why is it that important to have a definition? Why can't we deal with terrorism without having a common definition? Actually, this is indeed something that is also debated, that is also challenged, because there are experts who put forward very substantial arguments claiming that there are actually definitions of terrorism, or at least there's enough substance uh, in order to be able to, I mean, uh, constitute as some sort of a ground upon which we can build a, a model for dealing with terrorism or just, you know, uh, or concentrate our efforts to deal with terrorism. And they make references to some of the UN resolutions, uh, to some legal documents, procedural issues, and within these documents they say, and they are right, and we'll be talking about these things and I will, you know, bring this information to the class next Tuesday because this is something that requires a little bit of time and it is not something that we can cover within one hour today. So, uh, and these documents, these definitions, no matter whether these are officially acknowledged as being the definition of terrorism, we don't actually need such definitions, they say, in order to deal with terrorism. But putting this aside for a while, we'll, we'll you know, um, come back to the issue why is it that important to have a definition? Why, is it, why, why can't we survive without having a definition of terrorism? Why, why is it that important? Why, what is the significance of having a common understanding of terrorism? Um, because without definition, we cannot solve the problem. We cannot understand or comprehend the causes and the mm -hmm. solutions for that problem. Yeah, understanding of the problem, the causes and the consequences of terrorism is important in order to be able to deal with properly. Um, what else? I mean, this is, yes, one reason why it is important to um, deal with terrorism, but what else? Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, this is, again, something that has been overly emphasized, especially by Turkish officials. And in the years when we were dealing with struggling against the PKK terrorism, for instance, since 83, 84, when you know, the PKK uh, started to take lives uh, with their attacks, especially in the southern, southeastern part of Turkey, and we had very hard time in explaining ourselves and ex uh, sort of uh, convincing our allies within the uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, and also within other you know, um, institutional fora in, in Europe or anywhere else. And we could not uh, mobilize support in our uh, fight against the PKK. So again, why is this that important? I mean, sometimes uh, states, you know, uh, for instance, in, in, in the context of Turkish-Greek relations, or in the context of Turkey-Syrian relations, as a much more specific example, Turkey did not need any other country to deal with the problem. Yes, 
Other countries were involved, especially Egypt. Uh, Mubarak, the president of Egypt, took uh, initiative uh, and tried to convince uh, Hafiz al-Assad as well as the Turkish uh, uh, president, uh, Suleyman Demirel, to take uh, such actions so as not to you know, uh, confront uh, in, the, in the battlefield. And especially it was uh, Hafiz al-Assad who should have been convinced to take certain actions such as not to give any more support uh, to the PKK. And then uh, Turkey's stance, powerful stance, its uh, coercive diplomacy, so to speak, uh, paid. I mean, and then what we have seen uh, was the result pretty much Turkey expected to see. And we have been, uh, we were capable of solving the problem on a bilateral basis. Yes, with the intervention of some other uh, countries in terms of, you know, through their diplomatic uh, offices, et cetera, et cetera. But on a one-on-one -on -one basis, Turkey was capable of solving the problem. Also with other countries. And this is not only peculiar to Turkey's Syrian context, there are other cases where you know, uh, countries may solve their problems, their security problems with uh, other countries on a bilateral basis. But is this the case uh, with terrorism? No, and that's why this, it is important to have a common definition. If not a formal definition, what we need is a common understanding. Who are the so-called terrorist organizations, or I mean terrorist, terrorists, uh, what kind of actions constitute terrorist act that must be uh, confronted with a uh, concerted action uh, by the community of peace-loving nations. So this is therefore very, very important. And this is the, if not the single most, but one of the biggest obstacles in front of uh, uh, the measures that are required to dealing with terrorism. So being the academic advisor of NATO Center of Excellence Defense Against Terrorism, established by the Turkish General Staff and now a NATO organization, it's an international military organization with international staff. Over the past five years that I'm there, I'm helping them with putting together some activities. Of course, academic activities or activities that have academic dimensions. And so far, I don't know, we have realized uh, endless number, countless number of activities in extending from workshops to courses to symposia and conferences. The, the recurring theme, the, the most important theme that we you know, refer back to it many times, again and again, is and almost every single speaker, regardless of the subject matter, which could be uh, financial aspects of dealing with terrorism or legal aspects of dealing with terrorism, sociological, ideological, whatever, logical address, you know, aspects of dealing with terrorism, every single speaker, I mean, there is not maybe one speaker who has not touched upon this issue of lack of common understanding or lack of common definition of terrorism, which he or she sees as the most important uh, obstacle in uh, effectively dealing with this issue. So therefore, uh, it is important to have one. But are we going to have one in, in any time soon in the future, or in the foreseeable future? It doesn't seem to be likely. But again, as I said, and as we'll be talking about later on, this should not constitute a, a major obstacle, yet it is one, um, because uh, this is something that reminds me of uh, the definition of aggression. Uh, I don't know, we actually made some references to Article 39 of uh, United Nations chapter, uh, which is the first article of chapter seven. The UN Charter has a number of chapters, and as you know, chapter seven deals with uh, issues, uh, uh, the breaches of peace and measures that, are, that, that, that can be taken uh, against such violations, which may also incorporate use of force. And chapter seven of uh, UN Charter starts with, with article 39, 
And if you go on and look at the Article 39, you will see that there is reference to acts of aggression. And Article 39 being the first article of Chapter 7 under the UN Charter is significant in the sense that, I mean, you start, I mean, if you look at the issue from uh, within the context of Chapter 7, that means you may use course of uh, diplomacy or force in order to convince or persuade the uh, aggressor, which has committed an act of aggression, actually, and to remedy the situation. Remember, we talk about Iraq, Iraq uh, invading Kuwait. That was a violation of international law, and this issue was uh, discussed at the United Nations Security Council within the context of Chapter 7, and with Article 39, UN, UN Security Council members have acknowledged, have recognized that there was an act of aggression and that Iraq was an aggressor. But this being the case, from 1945 to 1974, well, approximately 30 years, the, the act of aggression or aggressor They were not defined. And that was, the, of course, uh, one of the most interesting periods of the Cold War. And what was aimed with the United Nations uh, Charter was to you know, establish a committee composed of the, that will be composed of the, uh, the chiefs of general staffs of the five permanent members, the military staff committee, that would handle the situation in, you know, with uh, uh, close coordination and to sort of uh, display a huge power because who could beat the five permanent members of the United Nations being the most important, not only politically, but also militarily, uh, uh, most important countries of the United Nations. And what was expected to establish such a committee which would look into such issues, which would constitute an act of aggression and in order to penalize or punish the aggressors, which would have disturbed the international peace and stability. But from 49 to 74, 45 to 74, it was not possible to have a common understanding of which acts were uh, or would constitute an act of aggression. What, for instance, the United States considered to be an act of aggression, along with um, France or, uh, or United Kingdom, China, I mean, the Communist China, after taking seat in the United Nations Security Council, and uh, the Soviet Union, well, disagreed. Or vice versa, what the Soviet Union might have considered as an act of aggression, uh, United States and its Western allies did not uh, think alike. So therefore, it, there was a deadlock in the United Nations Security Council in terms of taking decisions because it was not possible to define which acts were constituting an act of aggression. Because it, unless you define an act of aggression, you cannot go forward with other articles 40, 41, 42, which would pay the way to eventually, not at the beginning, but uh, and down the road, the use of force. The same situation, more or less, applies to today's uh, situation with respect to the issue of terrorism. I mean, without having a common understanding, let alone a formal definition, but at least an acknowledgement of which acts or which inst sort of groupings, which organizations uh, are or can be labeled as terrorist organiza organizations or which acts could be labeled as terrorist acts, without having this common understanding, you cannot expand the uh, the front, uh, which would fight collectively, um, and of course using with uh, all the capabilities that would have, uh, that would have against the uh, terrorist uh, organizations. So, especially today, in the modern age, and more specifically, after the end of the Cold War, things have changed dramatically in many fields and also in the field of terrorism or terrorism studies or the study of terrorism has to incorporate uh, new elements, new uh, 
a fresh look into what is actually going on because the profile of terrorist organizations, the profile of terrorism, the profile of terrorists are changing. So therefore, this is important because terrorism today is not something that one single nation all alone can cope with. If a country is exposed to a certain degree of terrorism, that country must be getting help, assistance, um, or some sort of a cooperation from other nations. Because what especially today we're talking about is not the terrorism uh, that we used to you know, know from our readings, from, from what we have seen in the media or on TV channels, but things are changing rather fast. And just like any other thing, a terrorism also is globalized. Because, I mean, uh, there is this principle which applies even to today's situation, but it is not any more sufficient to explaining terrorism. But what is usually um, believed by those who are dealing with terrorism, either as an academic exercise or as part of intelligence or uh, uh, units or security forces. This belief has always been uh, upheld by many people that terrorist organizations cannot survive without state or without a state or states sponsoring them. And this sponsorship is something that is not necessarily uh, relying on you know, the, the financial assets being made available to terrorist organizations. It expands from providing shelter, providing safe havens to terrorist organizations, you know, giving them a, a certain territory for their control, like Beka Valley, for instance, in Lebanon, or today the uh, Kandil Mountains uh, in northern part of Iraq, or other places wherever terrorism is taking you know, uh, place. So uh, in the past, terrorism was usually associated with state sponsorship. And which is still the case. I mean, this, terrorist, this type of terrorism did not just evaporate, just still exists. And maybe uh, it, it is still one of the most important uh, sort of uh, topics that one has to look into in order to understand what is going on. But uh, over the last decade or so, or you know, after 9-11, we have seen clearly, but prior to 9-11, there were some uh, clues, there were some developments that, that would have provided hints or clues or some you know, uh, points that we, we could you know, understand, uh, is that today's terrorism or terrorist organizations do not necessarily need a sponsoring state. Yes, it is better from their perspective if they had states that would sponsor their activities, but the type of terrorism that we are dealing with, the so-called transnational terrorism or global terrorism by transnational actors, which are not necessarily motivated by as they used to be, as others have used to be, uh, I mean, ideological factors such as separatist terrorism, ideological terrorism, uh, which carry out activities in order to uh, liberate a certain territory, for instance, like the Basque terrorism or ETA or like the IRA, like the PKK, like the Tamil Tigers, or others. Or there are some ideological terrorism which do not necessarily have some territorial claims, but have some ideological political claims, or you know, carry out activities just for the sake of advancing certain political thought, not necessarily you know, uh, capturing a certain territory, such as Red Brigades, or Biden Meinhof. So, uh, or there are some fanatical uh, terrorist organizations, I mean, not necessarily uh, associated with a specific religion or uh, 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 monotheistic uh, 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 religion, but such as the Aum Shinrikyo, for instance, in the fa in Far East, in Japan. So these were terrorist groups which had more or less a specific location that intelligence agencies, through infiltrating into this sort of groups uh, by you know, uh, uh, somehow recruiting some 
insider, uh, insiders from within these groups or just, you know, through surveillance, through other intelligence activities, um, it would not be that difficult to locate more or less where these people would be, you know, uh, you know training, would be getting their training, where these people would uh, somehow, you know, appear to be. Like uh, Syria, for instance. But of course, not Syria only alone. Uh, Iraq, Iran, and uh, other countries' territories have been used by the terrorist organization, the PKK, for so many years, for the, for the last two, three decades. With or without knowledge of these countries' authorities, of course, I personally don't believe that uh, the local authorities would not, uh, would definitely have information about the activities of the, these groups. There is no such a thing that uh, a, the local government or the governments of uh, uh, certain countries whose territories have been used by terrorist organizations, there is no possibility that these governments wouldn't know anything about them. So that would be impossible, next to impossible. But of course, there may be some difficulties in dealing with, in coping with terrorist organizations, and they may not see as being their problem because they may have to uh, allocate large sums of, uh, large numbers of people, and you know, uh, conducting or carrying out some counterinsurgency operations would be costly for them, and they would be, there would be no reason for them to deal with the terrorist organizations who are using their territories, because terrorist organization may not commit any activity, may not stage any attack against these countries' people. So therefore, countries whose territory, territories are being used by terrorist organizations may turn aloof, uh, may, may turn a blind eye uh, um, to the activities of these organizations. But some, le, le, uh, instead of turning a blind eye, may just want to use terrorist organization, organizations as a proxy element, um, especially that was the case during the Cold War period, because during the Cold War period, because of the, um, the mutual assured destruction situation between the uh, the two blocs, the United States, the Soviet Union, NATO, Warsaw Pact. The, the idea was to not let the local conflicts escalate into a major conflict that would drag in the superpowers. So many countries which had problems with other countries uh, had to find ways of dealing with these problems on, on their own. Just like I mentioned at the beginning of the semester, Turkey was told by its Western allies not to have any problem with its Middle Eastern neighbors because uh, France, United Kingdom, United States, and other allies of Turkey within NATO, they wouldn't like to see Turkey and Syria, for instance, uh, confronting each other in the battlefield that would drag in the United uh, States or NATO uh, countries. And because Syria would have uh, close alliance relationship with the Soviet Union that would also bring in the Soviets into the picture. And then because of turkish syrian conflict, there will be uh, a major conflict between the two blocs. So in the, in the impossibility or in the extreme difficulty of having or fighting an open war in the battlefield, countries have used some proxy elements in order to damage the interests of other countries. And because, for instance, uh, in the, uh, during the Cold War years, especially starting with the 1960s, because Turkey and Syria, as well as Iraq, they all have embarked on large irrigation projects, and, and therefore which increase the demand on the waters of the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, Turkey, Iraq, and Syria have found themselves in a conflict over the waters of the Euphrates. And one way to solve this conflict, of course, might have been to have op open confrontation. That, of course, nobody wanted this to happen, but th this is you know, what one can think about a possible resolution of conflicts other than diplomacy. But since Turkey and Syria could not fight or could not dare fighting each other, and Syria was using the PKK as a proxy element in order to damage Turkey's interests, which retarded, as you know very well, uh, for at least a couple of decades, and also costed not only uh, billions and billions of dollars, but also lives of thousands of people, security forces and civilian personnel. 
as a military person and civilian people, and by way of giving support to the PKK. So therefore, terrorist organizations can be used as a proxy uh, war tactic. You do not uh, sort of uh, involve in an open conflict, but you use terrorist organization which might damage or cause damages even more than uh, the damage that you could cause maybe by way of fighting that country. And this is not the only issue. Um, I remember uh, many years ago, like seven, eight years ago, the Spanish ambassador was here in order to give us some, uh, you know, uh, some of his uh, ex experience and accumulation with respect to Spain's, you know, negotiations with uh, the European Union. Spanish, Portuguese, and Greek ambassadors were there, and he was preaching on uh, on us actually about you know the, the 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 beauty of democratization and solving the terrorism problem this and that. I asked him a question. I said, uh, would you be able to democratize yourselves? Because they had a bloody civil war, they were under Franco regime, and to some, Spain is still not democratic. This is not my personal view, but some people think that way because there's still this you know, uh, issue, the Basque issue or other issue are, are not solved properly in the view of other people. But yet, I ask him, would you be able to democratize yourselves and also improve your economy and then become a member of the European Union had France not uh, uh, sort of uh, stopped its, of course, political or otherwise support to the, to the Basque issue? He said no. And thanks to cooperation, cooperation that we, Spain received from France, after France decided not to provide shelter or safe haven to some of the ETA members because they have not seen as, they have not considered these people as being terrorists. They consider them as you know, freedom fighters. That they have considered these people as being uh, you know, uh, uh, people who were pursuing a political agenda rather than you know, uh, staging terrorist attacks. But then France has changed its mind, and French and Spanish uh, governments have cooperated against ETA, and you know, ETA was somehow uh, uh, lost the war. I mean, if there was any. So therefore, Spain, in a sense, uh, uh, could save large sums of money that he, Spain would have otherwise allocated to the fight against terror saved the lives of many people, civilians and security forces, and also was able to democratize its constitution. So therefore, it is of utmost importance uh, that states that are, or you know, countries that are uh, exposed to terrorism, uh, it is essential that they get support of other countries. But the situation until recently, and still is the case in some respects, there are some cases that we'll be talking about, but the situation was the opposite. Terrorist organizations were getting support, knowingly or unknowingly, just or either through uh, indifference or through active support, or through active coordination with terrorist organizations. Some states have seen this as, a, or have used terrorist organizations as an element of their foreign policy. And some, as I said, have just been, remained uh, aloof from what was going on remain indifferent to what was going on. And by remaining uh, or staying indifferent, that was also another type of support because terrorist organizations need to be uh, dealt with uh, extreme coordination among intelligence organizations. But, and this is something other than, you know, uh, you know uh, underlining or emphasizing that uh, Definition of terrorism is of utmost importance. Another issue which always, almost in every speech, in every conversation, in every writing, anything that you can think of terrorism, the other theme that, re that is occurring is the need of intelligence sharing. Because we are dealing with an entity which you do not necessarily know where actually it is. You know the headquarters of... Uh, or the capital of a state. 
I mean, country X, country Y, every single country on the surface of the Earth uh, has a capital city. You can know through intelligence, through satellite pictures, through human intelligence, other type of um, uh, in, uh, information collection. You may have a great deal of information about other states. The population, the strength, the weaknesses, the number of troops, uh, military uh, capabilities, economic capabilities, uh, underground resources, um, I don't know, all sorts of facilities, technical or military or sensitive you know, parts. So it is not difficult to have an estimate about the, the, the capabilities or the extent of threat that may be posed by other states to you. But even in the past, and it is much more difficult to have an accurate estimate today uh, about what the capabilities, capabilities of uh, terrorist organizations are. You're dealing with a ghost. I mean, especially today, uh, when we talk about transnational terrorism, I will give more uh, or pay more emphasis on this, uh, especially on Tuesday, but this is one of the biggest difficulties. Even in the past, even we, for instance, in dealing with ETA, IRA, PKK, Tamils, and others, or Red Brigades, and uh, by the mind of or, or all sorts of other you know, ideological separatists, whatever type of or, or fanatical organizations, it, even with them, and today the situation is much more difficult, it is highly difficult to have an accurate estimate about uh, the capabilities who the people are, I mean, whether there is a hierarchical stru structure, whether there is a chain of command, who are involved in whatever type of responsibilities within the terrorist organization, where are they located. So this is very difficult. And one way to have the most accurate information is to have intelligence. And once uh, a, 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 an intelligence organization collects that information, it has to share in theory, or this is the ideal situation, with other intelligence units, with other intelligence agencies of other countries. But this is, in practice, almost next to impossible, let alone sharing intelligence among states. Intelligence services do not share intelligence with other departments of the state, I mean state mechanism, and let alone sharing with other states or other uh, parts of or, or units of bureaucracy, intelligence services do not uh, disclose information to other people within the same intelligence services. It is because of the very nature of intelligence. Things must be secret. Of course, that was until WikiLeaks. <laughs> well, WikiLeaks, uh, whatever information can be found there, as many people have emphasized, I, it's not a big deal. It, these are not things that people didn't know. But uh, actually, what was important was that people have at least now an argument to blame each other. But secret or top secret or cosmic intelligence, they are not uh, at least so far disclosed. And not very likely to, especially top secret and other type of information, because, well, maybe technologically possible, but still there will be uh, a long way toward sharing uh, effectively intelligence. What the United States did right after 9-11 was to establish a committee which is, which is known as 9-11 Committee. And 9-11 Committee established within the Senate, of course, with the help of uh, experts and a uh, large number of stuff. Uh, they have published a book, which I would strongly recommend you to read. And it was distributed freely in the United States in every library or just at a very, very low price, like something like 99 cents. So um, and in this book, you see the 15 or so different intelligence services extended from Coast Guard to uh, military intelligence or CIA, FBI, et cetera, and other organizations. Uh, the lack of coordination was one of the reasons why 9-11 could uh, become a reality. I mean, it was not something unthinkable. There were different scenarios, there were different, uh, I would say, uh, writings or thoughts, including mine, before 9-11, 
and long before 9-11, that something similar could happen. But what was, of course, uh, found to be uh, why this, the reason why this has happened was even though intelligence services in the United States in their individual capacity were somehow tracking with the activities of those who were involved in 9-11, at some point they lost track with these people because of lack, lack of coordination among themselves. So you see, a country like the United States, which has all sorts of military and technical and human capa capabilities to, to collect accurate information, accurate intelligence on a timely basis that could be activated, that could be actionable. I mean, you know, you know, some measures could be taken on the spot, right on time. Even such a country which its enormous capabilities, and maybe that was the problem, the enormity of the capabilities, but yet uh, they failed to uh, stop 9-11. Well, uh, some, some of you might be thinking, like some others, the United States has done this to itself. Well, I don't think they're so dumb people. So, uh, therefore, I don't believe the United States did it to itself. But there may be some other explanations as to whether they could expect such a huge damage. Or maybe they were late in taking action. I don't know. These are issues that may be uh, revealed to public in the coming decades. But the problem here, therefore, is there, is there are basically two major obstacles. One is definition of terrorism, which prevents states from cooperating with each other effectively. And in the same way, in the same context, lack of coordination or cooperation in the area of intelligence sharing. And these are interrelated, because if states do not agree on which activities or which acts are terrorist acts or terrorist activities and which groups are terrorist groups or, or freedom fighters, whatever, and if they don't agree on that, how can you expect these states to share intelligence? But even if for a second we presume, we, we, we think that states have come to a common understanding as to which acts are terrorist acts and which acts activities are terrorist activities and that, that must be stopped, prevented uh, on a timely basis. And then that it, it requires uh, intelligence sharing. Even if they agree on the definition of terrorism, the next step, intelligence cooperation or cooperation in the field of intelligence may not come because of the very nature of intelligence, as I said, because intelligence uh, organizations, intelligence agencies are very jealous uh, about the, their um, sources of information, source of intelligence, and they make uh, some secondary, tertiary considerations as to whether the, uh, the outcome that may be uh, uh, gained uh, out of cooperation, would, it, would this be detrimental in the secondary or third, um, the following stages. Because once you disclose your source, then you expose your source to certain dangers, and then you stop getting intelligence. And you may be successful on this particular case, but because of lack of sources or just disappearance of your source or just uh, elimination of your source by the enemy, then you may be helpless in other cases, in the future cases. So, Therefore, it is very difficult to expect intelligence cooperation among states and also within the intelligence, within the same state or even within the same intelligence service. So therefore, terrorism is something that is far more difficult for statesmen, for uh, politicians, for everyone to cope with, to, de to deal with. And what is more, of course, uh, threatening is Unless this happens, terrorism is not going to go anywhere. Terrorist groups will not disappear by themselves. And as we have not seen, luckily, so far, well, activities of terrorist organizations may not remain at the same level where they have so far been successful to, you know, whatever activities uh, uh, they did. But what is uh, on the horizon which is not something negligible, well, maybe something not very, very probable, but something uh, which might be 
hugely cost or catastrophic is terrorism with weapons of mass destruction. So therefore, unless a certain degree of common understanding and also sharing of intelligence is achieved, we may not be able to deal with the catastrophic consequence of what may be lying ahead on the horizon, which is uh, terrorism with weapons of mass destruction. And this will be the subject of next week's, uh, Tuesday's uh, discussion. And I would strongly recommend you, and bear in mind, because I may very well think of giving you a quiz, unless I feel like uh, you have uh, read your uh, articles. Uh, read the two pieces that I sent already, and I will send you two or three other pieces, and a PowerPoint, which I will use here next Tuesday, and familiarize yourselves with the subject, because this is sub a subject which is actually a, a semester-long topic. But we are, of course, not able to deal with the issue through the entire semester. So I strongly recommend you to read, your, uh, read the attachments as well as look at the PowerPoint before you come to class on Tuesday next week. I'll see you then.